This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. It's time for This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on June 27th, 2014. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. TWIV is coming to you today from Hamilton, Montana. I'm at the Rocky Mountain Laboratories, which is part of the National Institutes of Health. And I have three guest scientists joining me today. Uh, to my left, he is the chief of the biology of vector-borne viruses section in the Laboratory of Virology. And he's also associate director for science management here, Marshall Bloom. What do you say? Well, you have to say something. Hi, how are if you? If you wave your hand, okay. nobody will hear you. <laughs> okay. well, uh, welcome. Th welcome. Welcome, and welcome to you. And I want to thank you for taking the time to come out and visit RML for a couple days here in western Montana. My pleasure. My pleasure and thank you for joining us and talking about this place and the science here. Uh, also joining us today, the second to my left, she is a chief of the Innate Immunity and Pathogenesis Unit in the Laboratory of Virology, Sonia Best. Good morning. Morning. Welcome to TWIV. Thank you very much. I appreciate you doing this. It's my pleasure. I know that it's a little nerve-wracking, but uh, you'll be fine. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, all the way on my left there, he is the chief of the TSE, TSE, Prion Biochemistry Section in the Laboratory of Persistent Viral Diseases, Byron Coy. Hi, everybody. Byron, right? Byron. Not yeah. Brian. Byron. I Byron. Think, I did say Brian a few times, so sorry about that. Thanks for everyone joining Everyone does. Everyone does? <laughs> So you're lumping me with everyone else there. Uh, so we're going to talk with these scientists about what they do and uh, how they got here in particular. This is Hamilton, Montana. It's in the middle of nowhere, <laughs> pretty much. And this room is full. There's a room full of uh, scientists here as well, uh, people who work here. So thank you for coming. And you're welcome to laugh and scream and make noises at any time. And particularly at the end when we're done, please applause, <laughs> whether, you, whether you liked it or not. So I, got, I had the opportunity to visit the BSL-4 laboratory here. That's my second BSL-4. I visited the needle in Boston. We made a documentary about it. This was actually a working BSL-4. There were people working inside, and they waved to me because they, <laughs> I guess they recognized me. And it was pretty cool to see that after being in the needle. Uh, and just for your information, I'm heading off to Australia next week where I'll be going to Geelong. Well done. They got it. Yeah. <laughs> Geelong and visiting their BSL-4 uh, with Lin Fa and his bat viruses. So, and then who knows, maybe I'll be the, the, the roving investigator of BSL-4 laboratories. Of course, I can't go into most of them, but uh, although the one in Australia, they're bringing me in, they're suiting me up, and I, don't, I guess the regulations are different there. Well, the question is, do they bring you out? Yeah, they're going to bring you out. <laughs> you want me to stay in there? <laughs> <laughs> you have to tell my family that, you know? <laughs> so I'm having a good time here. I've been here for a couple of days. I uh, gave a seminar yesterday, and uh, today we're going to talk about you guys. So let's start with that. And what I want to do first is to find out how you got here in the middle of nowhere, pretty much. Uh, let's talk about where you were born and raised and educated. Let's start with you. Well, I'm not going to give you the 50-minute version, <laughs> like some people have. <laughs> so I'm originally from Dallas, Texas. I went to college and medical school in St. Louis at Washington U. Uh, <clears throat> I was a pediatric, pediatric intern there for one year and then moved to Rocky Mountain Labs in 1972. And with the exception of a two-year fellowship in the Laboratory of Biology of Viruses back in Bethesda, from 1975 until 1977. I've spent my entire career here at Rocky Mountain Labs for the first uh, 30 years. I worked on a parvovirus. And then in 2002, 
uh, when I was appointed associate director for Rocky Mountain Labs, uh, I shifted from par uh, par negative sense, single-stranded, small, unenveloped DNA virus mm -hmm. to a, a single-stranded plus sense RNA virus system, the flaviviruses. You saw the light. Well, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> I suppose. It's still a little dim, but <laughs> I guess you could say I saw it. And so that, that's basically it. How, how did you get to, to be involved with viruses? Is that something that was, you, you know, were interested in or you just fell into it? When I was in um, medical school, um, I took care of a young girl who had uh, glomerulonephritis mm -hmm. consequent to, an infect to infectious mononucleosis, the virus for which had only recently been discovered at that time. And I became curious, well, you know, how can a virus which makes your lymph nodes swell up uh, cause glomerulonephritis? And then when I got close to the end of uh, medical school and was trying to decide whether to go into the uh, Army or to go to the NIH, uh, I was able to find a lab at the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, Rocky Mountain Labs, where people were working on virus-induced kidney disease, Lucian Mink disease, which is what I studied. Mm -hmm. And um, worked on that for like about 30 years, you know, from, and we went, we went from uh, growing virus by injecting mink and then 10 days later grinding up their livers and spleens to molecular clones of parvoviruses and then after about 30 years, I sort of figured, well, you know, I've done everything with this I can do. I want to try something else. So we shifted into the uh, tick-borne flaviviruses. This was partly because at that time was when the initial plans for building the BSO-4 facility that you saw yesterday uh, were being conceived, and I was made associate director. And I said, you know, I ought to be working on one of the viruses which has some level 4 members in it. And so we picked the tick-borne encephalitis viruses, which are flaviviruses, and those, that was an easy choice for me because the history of Rocky Mountain Labs, as you know, is basically based around tick-borne diseases. And since the same tick vector that carries Lyme disease and babesiosis uh, is the tick that carries the, some of the tick-borne flaviviruses, there were people who were working on those ticks, we decided that would be a good one to study. So who would you say your mentors were in your training? Uh, uh, I guess you didn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just trying to think of who to say that isn't going to kill me. <laughs> well, I think one of my main mentors here was uh, Bruce Cheeseboro, mm -hmm. uh, who's uh, the chief of the Laboratory of Persistent Viral Diseases. And he and I arrived at Rocky Mountain Labs uh, at, at, at the same time. Then when I was back in the uh, National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases in Maryland, uh, that was a, a terrific time. It was really the onset of molecular virology. So I was in a lab with George Corey and Peter Howley and Bernie Moss and Mal Martin and uh, a few other people. And those, the, the, you know, they, since I was a lost soul from Montana, they sort of all took me under their wing. And then when I came back here, we pretty much worked on parvoviruses uh, solely. Right. Sonia, tell us where you were born and educated. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm originally from Adelaide, Australia, and I grew up there, did my undergraduate there, and then I moved across to Canberra and the Australian National University to do my PhD, which was on pox viruses. Who was that with? That was with Peter Kerr, and uh, it was really about virus host evolution and how the, these viruses were shaping the European rabbit population in Australia and vice versa. So you're the one who released the virus in Australia to kill the Thankfully, rabbit? Thankfully that was before my time, <laughs> <laughs> but, but we were able to recover, or actually some of my mentors, Peter Kerr and others, recovered these viruses, actually before that probably Frank Fenner recovered these viruses from the environment and so we were able to look at evolution of these viruses over time. And actually then I met Marshall at a, an ASV meeting in Bozeman and that kind of struck that relationship and I came out here for a postdoc with Marshall a little bit later, mm -hmm. a year or so, a couple of years, and uh, started working with him for almost 10 years, I think, before I got my own lab. Uh, and so obviously, I've stayed here. So you came as the postdoc and stayed on. Mm -hmm. I guess I you love Hamilton, huh? I do love Hamilton. It's, where else do we get to you know, live in this incredible environment, have this amazing support for our science, 
and you know go home and have a hundred mu hundred mile view up and down the Rocky Mountains. Yeah, Manhattan, you know? New York City. Oh yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, yeah and I, then I get to visit those places. <laughs> so yeah. So when you were a postdoc with Marshall, what viruses did you work on? We were working on parvoviruses then, their relationship with cell death and apoptosis, which is normally antiviral. So this, the virus wants to keep that cell alive. And these viruses actually capitalized on that antiviral response and facilitated their replication through the death of the cell. So it was kind of an interesting paradox at the, the time. The first instance of a DNA virus being dependent on apoptosis for its replication, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and she showed that. So I know now you're working on plus strand RNA viruses. You have also seen the light. When did you switch over? When well, Marshall at the did? same time as Marshall, that was um, kind of a dual effort, I guess, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. Marshall was busy with the associate directorship and getting this building built, and so that was an opportunity for me to explore some questions within the interferon response and understanding how those interactions within the first few hours of infection can shape the outcome of disease. Right. <clears throat> so Byron, where were you raised and educated? I was born in New Hampshire and uh, lived in several states on my way to Colorado where I went to Colorado State University for undergraduate uh, school and there I had my first experience working with deadly untreatable pathogens and in uh, George Hill's lab who's, who had figured out how to culture African trypanosomes, infectious forms of African trypanosomes in large, in large amounts and I remember being impressed as an undergraduate with making vast amounts of this material uh, tiny, and being told a, a tiny pinprick or a broken <laughs> cover slip or whatever could likely lead to our deaths. Uh, so, that <laughs> so that gave me an appreciation for the power of infectious pathogens. And from there, uh, I was trying to decide whether to go to art school or biochemistry, and I was seduced into going to graduate school at University of Wisconsin uh, in biochemistry. And um, Willie Gibbons lab, structural biology, neurobiology, uh, went on to short postdoc at Duke University, Norman Kirshner's lab working on how adrenal glands make uh, adrenaline, basically. And then when uh, Norm Kirshner told me he was running short of money and that for safety's sake I should look for another postdoc, I went off to biochemistry meetings and uh, ran into Bruce Cheesebro uh, from here, the head of chief, as you've already heard, of LPVD, who is looking for a biochemist to help him work on these weird, new, uh, deadly, untreatable pathogens that are now called prions. And, it, and at that time, were of greatest concern uh, as the cause of human Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease, or CJD, or um, Kuru uh, in New Guinea, or scraping in sheep. And so that's what led me to, uh, despite warnings that <laughs> leaving the East Coast and going to the Rocky Mountain West would be like committing career suicide, um, uh, I decided to uh, come out here and go back West. And I've been here ever since. So you said you were thinking, be, you were deciding on a career between art and science. So what got you interested in science to begin with? Oh, I suppose I have to say my father is a biochemistry professor. There you go. Yeah. That's easy. And curiosity. I mean, he didn't push me, of course, but at all. But uh, yeah, basic curiosity. Although it doesn't always work that way because my dad was a doctor and he wanted me to be a doctor, but I didn't want to be. So you don't always father, follow what your parents do. No, my father would have been just as happy if I were an artist. <laughs> so, Sonia, how did you get interested in science? I think it was definitely Dad as well. Um, he was head of the National Parks and Wildlife System in South Australia, Department of Environment and Heritage. And, you know, as kids we'd camp and, and we'd fish and he'd always be, you know, showing us how these different um, animals, 
and even the plants and things interacted. It was just a very important part of the way that we grew up. And so I always wanted to be an ecologist, but actually Dad thought that, that I wouldn't survive out in the field without a shower every day. <laughs> and, uh, and so he kind of was the one who gently led me more to wildlife diseases, and that was the myxoma thing. And then eventually, this is where I am. Mm -hmm. What about you, Marshall? You, you want to be a doctor, right? Well, can I tell you a funny story? Sure. <laughs> so I have a cousin named Floyd who uh, was, is a neuroscientist at Scripps. And uh, he's, I think, about 10 years older than me. And, you know, he was editor of, editor in chief of science and all kinds of stuff. Very, very terrific scientific communicator. Really brought the magazine Science into the electronic age. And um, he wanted to go uh, into public relations. And his father, my uncle, my dad's partner in a drugstore, he told him, he says, you know, I'd really like to do this. And his dad told him, he says, well, that's fine. You can do whatever you want after you become a doctor. <laughs> and so there was a lot of pressure in our family. Uh, my dad and two of his uncles were pharmacists, had always wanted to be doctors, had wanted to be physicians, but weren't able to accomplish that. And then, so my cousin uh, went to Wash U Medical School, graduated in 1960, and that's where I went. And then that's an amazing medical school where a phenomenal emphasis is paced placed on a scientific approach to medicine and research. And so if you sort of go there, I mean, you're almost, it's almost inevitable that you're going to end up in a research career. And so, uh, you know, he went from there to NIH and so did I. Hmm. It's funny that you mentioned pharmacy. This is, you know, Tony Fauci's family. Exactly. Tony Fauci's pharmacy, pharmacy. In Brooklyn, exactly. right? Exactly. Well, he and I swapped stories about, we both worked as clerks. Tony and I both worked as clerks. Uh, in pharmacies, in our dad's pharmacies. So, Marshall, tell us how this uh, laboratory got to be here in the uh, middle of what I say is nowhere. I don't want to offend anyone, but it's pretty remote. Uh, how did it get to be here? Tell us the history. Well, the antecedents of Rocky Mountain Lab can be traced back about 105 or 106 years when a novel disease Became, became uh, described uh, called, uh, variously called black measles uh, and spotted fever, mountain fever, ultimately became called Rocky Mountain spotted fever. The public health service, and I want to point out, this was a, we would call that now an emerging infectious disease. Okay. It had unknown cause, no treatment, no vaccine, and people didn't know how it was spread. Something like that came up today, they'd probably work with it at but level four. And that, those days, they worked with them in log cabins and tents. So Howard Ricketts was sent out from Chicago to figure out what was going on. And within a few years of coming, he, and by 1907, he had determined that this was an infectious disease. It was spread by, carried by ticks. And you could grind up ticks and infect uh, experimental animals and even a couple of monkeys, and they would get sick. And he ended up dying a couple years later studying a typhus outbreak in uh, Mexico City, but the people that he attracted to work with him went on to found what is now uh, Rocky Mountain Laboratories. And we've been in the current location here since about 1930. Uh, and over the years, it, you know, uh, Harold Cox discovered the bacteria that causes Q fever here, identified that. Um, there was a lot of work that did, went on during World War II on yellow fever mostly production of yellow fever vaccine, a really cool story. Uh, and then in the 19, um, uh, early 1980s, Willie Bergdorfer, who's a medical entomologist who worked here, an expert on tick-borne diseases, was sent some ticks uh, by guys on the East Coast who were trying to figure out what the cause of this other emerging infectious disease called Lyme disease was. And Willie had developed a technique to cut off the feet of the tick, collect a drop of uh, hemolymph, and look at it under a microscope. And when he did that, he saw these sort of curly Q bacteria, and he says, that's a Borrelia. And that was named after him, Borrelia burgdorferi, and that's the etiologic agent that causes Lyme disease. So in the 20th century, those three infectious diseases were not only discovered by people associated with Rocky Mountain Lyme, but it was named after him. And then in addition uh, to that, there was a long history of work on other viral diseases. Uh, the first lab in the United States to work on uh, what are now called transmissible 
spongiform encephalopathies, which were called uh, slow viruses by Sigurdsson, a neuropathologist by the name of Bill Hadlow started that field by recognizing the, the field of human uh, TSE diseases by recognizing in a short letter to Lancet that the pathological findings in people dying of Kuru look just like scrapie. And that start, you know, that has led to really to two Nobel Prizes, one for Carl Gadjashek and the other for Stanley Pruser. And over the years, I mean, the place just sort of worked on kind of offbeat infectious diseases. And now we've got about 450 people working here, some but not all of which are in the audience. We have about 30 some odd, uh, 30 -some -odd buildings, <clears throat> five scientific departments, which are called labs with a capital L, two of which work on uh, viruses and, or prions, and three of which work on a variety of bacteria. So, so what's in it, a nutshell. It has a great history and there's an early reason right. why it's here, but why, well, it's a big place now, so it's not going anywhere, obviously. But what's the advantage of being here? Is there anything be good about being in a valley between two mountain ranges? Well, it was historical. Yeah. Uh, it was historical, and uh, in the early 1980s, or, or right around 1980s, the NIAID made a decision uh, to beef up the scientific research out here uh, at Rocky Mountain Laboratories, and although it would not have been articulated this way at the time, it would, there was a recognition, I think, by the Institute that said, this is a place which is really an epicenter for emerging infectious diseases, many of which are vector-borne. And if you go down the list of the infectious agents which are studied here, both viral and bacterial, uh, the majority of them are actually vector-borne diseases, ticks and fleas. What's the population of Hamilton? The population of Hamilton is about 5,000. When I moved here, there was one stoplight. Now I think we have like, what, four or five? Something like <laughs> that, right? Four or five stoplights. There was a Safeway. The roads were paved. There were party lines. Now we have the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Television. <laughs> right. You have cell phones, too. And right? cell phones, yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Um, yeah, it's a, sm it's a small town, but uh, I must say the coffee here is really good. I went to Big Creek. You guys like that? Better than Starbucks, for sure. That's for sure. And there's no Starbucks here, right? Not in, Mon not in Hamilton. Uh, there's, I think there's one, or, one in Missoula, three in Missoula, three in Missoula. Which reminds me, I don't have my cell phone. Can, what's the weather here today? Does anybody know? Overcast. Overcast 20 C, 20 degrees centigrade, roughly. It's been raining the few days that I've been here, yeah. That's unusual. It's really a dry climate. Yeah, I understand as you get more into the summer, it gets brown. Right, right. right. All right. So I want to come back to you in a bit, talk about science, but I want to first go to Sonia and talk about your stuff, which is very cool. You told, told me about it tomorrow. You work on, yesterday. Yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> you work on positive strand RNA viruses, and your, your interest is at the interferon virus interface, right? Yeah. So I really believe that the big decisions, many of the big decisions as to whether or not a host is going to recover from these virus infections are made within the first couple of days of infection. And it's this interface then between viruses and that intrinsic cellular response that um, is going to, to really determine the outcome. So these viruses are encountering very powerful host responses that's akin to that host pulling a fire alarm basically and, and calling in the cavalry and so these viruses have evolved various ways to counter those responses and silence those early alarms. They have and to otherwise they wouldn't exist. Right? Yeah otherwise they, they wouldn't be so able to I, be transmitted. I often say that every virus has to encode at least one antagonist. Do you think that's true? I think that that's largely true. I think that some of the Bunya viruses are teaching us that they don't have to be can, you know, really, really strong, 100% powerful antagonists. But absolutely, if you're going to be able to emerge, there's a number of uh, points of restriction. The first one is obviously going to be at the receptors, but then you encounter multiple points of restriction at that innate response. And so I think we used to think, you know, one protein, one antagonist kind of thing, but it's now becoming incredibly apparent that these antagonists are right in the right parts of the cell to shut down multiple pathways, and they do that. So I think in taking 
a new look at, at some of these proteins that we think we know the answers to is going to reveal more answers about you know, what the viruses are telling us are important for these early responses. Yeah. So, so you told me yesterday about a story where an RNA polymerase fulfills that function. Can you tell us how you got into that? Yeah, it's kind of crazy. So the, the, these flaviviruses are genetically relatively simple. They only have 10 proteins. And the largest and most conserved of those proteins is the polymerase because it has enzymatic functions that are required for its replication. And so when we first looked at the relative ability of all these individual proteins to suppress that interferon response, um, we found actually that it was this polymerase. And it was a surprise because other people in the field had reported some different proteins as being responsible. But when we looked at those proteins, we couldn't find a clear effect that would account for the, the ability of these viruses to suppress the response, which is absolutely striking. You know, you have an infected cell and that response is really dramatically shut down. And so that prompted us to, to look a little further into some of these additional proteins. And I'll never forget the day sitting in that microscope room where we're looking at these immunofluorescences and it was just clear as day and night that it was this NS5 protein. And when we mapped the regions within that protein that were responsible for antagonism, we found that the antagonism is basically just structurally imposed on that polymerase structure, which is also kind of remarkable because the polymerase <coughs> by its uh, requirement in replication, mm -hmm. is structurally very conserved. And you think that a viral protein that needs to interact with these different host responses is going to have some flexibility. But um, that must be built into this polymerase, but it's not immediately apparent how that does that. And it's separate from the polymerase and function. And it's completely separate, as far as we can tell, from that polymerase function in RNA replication. So can you inactivate the RNA polymerase catalytically and still has this antagonism function? Absolutely. These polymerases are defined by eight different motifs that are involved in interactions with RNA or metal ion binding, and we can inactivate every portion of that and it doesn't affect interferon antagonism. Mm -hmm. so. Which viruses have you identified this activity in? So um, this is a field that's involved a number of different investigators. We've been involved in work that has looked at uh, this function in a virus called Langat virus, which is an attenuated member of this tick-borne encephalitis group. We've also looked at tick-borne encephalitis virus itself. And then uh, we were involved in work that was looking at New York 99 strain of West Nile virus and showed that that one was a really good antagonist. Um, but that the closely related virus called Kunjin, which is a subtype of West Nile that's endemic to Australia, um, but it is, it's also attenuated and it's a pretty poor inhibitor of signaling. And we've kind of mapped the amino acids that are responsible for that as well. And then you've got these other viruses. So all those viruses cause encephalitis and you have uh, two other viruses that are major human pathogens, dengue and yellow fever. And at least for dengue, Adolfo Garcia Sastra's group has shown that it's also the NS5 protein, but it functions in a different way. So how does this polymerase, you know, ha actually is able to function in different parts of the pathway is another interesting question. So you said that Kunjin is a, an attenuated? Strain of West Nile strain. virus. So it does not cause encephalitis? No, it really only very sporadically do you ever see uh, it, infections in humans that result in any kind of disease. Interestingly, the, uh, there was a strain of Kunjin virus that was isolated in 2011 that was actually causing diseases in horses. Mm -hmm. And that had the mutations in the NS5 protein that were more similar to the New York 99 strain and therefore more able to inhibit interferon responses. But so despite its being um, less able to in interfere with interferon, yeah. <laughs> it still can, it's still successful in terms of transmission in a, in a host population. Absolutely. For it to be present continuously in the environment, that's the case. So when you say antagonize interferon, can you tell us how you measure that? For, these, for this particular problem where the polymerase is involved? 
So this is actually a fairly, um, thankfully, simple signaling pathway that we're looking at. Um, the once an interferon molecule binds to the surface receptors, it activates the JAK-STAT signaling cascade. And that can be just monitored by phosphorylation of the JAKs, which are the Janus kinases, or the STATs, which are the transcription factors that then relay that signal to the nucleus that, that interferon is, is, being, uh, is being made. And so if, if we just look at the phosphorylation status of those different proteins in the presence of our viral proteins. We can see by immunofluorescence, so visually, or flow cytometry, or Western blots, that those events are not occurring in infected cells. So the virus infects, it is sensed mm -hmm. by some of the sensors, cytoplasmic or membrane bound. Right? Yes. Interferon is made, as well as other cytokines. Yes. But then the signaling is prohibited by the viral RNA polymerase. Yes, so it seems that most of the genetic effort from these viruses seems to be put into really shutting down the interferon response once interferon has been made. And that's in contrast to a lot of other pathogenic viruses that like to prevent interferon from being made in the first place, which you'd think would be a more successful strategy in many ways. Um, some of the emerging literature is, is kind of changing to suggest that maybe dengue is actually attacking those very early uh, sensing responses, but it's, it's really this other arm that these viruses are concentrating on for some reason. So the, basically the outcome is to prevent the, the signaling pathway exists to induce the so-called interferon stimulated gene. So this would reduce those, the production of those antiviral proteins, right? Absolutely, yeah. So do you know which of those are important for inhibiting uh, these flaviviruses? Yeah, so this is another very hot area of research. Um, Mike Diamond and Michael Gale are obviously leaders in this field and um, some of the more interesting ISGs that have recently been identified include the IFIT proteins that are um, recognizing or not recognizing the capped structure of the viral RNA. Um, and then one of our favorite ones is an ISG called IRF1. And IRF1 is fascinating in that it's a transcription factor. So it can induce a wide range of ISGs in its own right. This is John Shoggins and Charlie Rice's work that, that is um, overlapping but can be independent of type 1 interferon. So you've got multiple waves of which in way or multiple waves of signal transduction that the cell can use to mount these responses that might not totally be dependent on type 1 interferon. And so that's a wonderfully strong ISG, but these flaviviruses come right in and get rid of that too. So they are starting to tell us a little bit more about how these innate responses are orchestrated, what's important for protection from infection, and then the ways that these viruses counter them. Yeah, yeah IRF1 is also inhibits poliovirus replication, right. which we found in that collaboration with Charlie and John. Does anyone know what is induced by IRF1 that is antiviral, or we're not there yet? In um, John and, and Charlie's work, they actually did a pretty clever thing. They used STAT1 knockout fibroblasts to examine ISG expression um, in response to activation of IRF1. And by taking STAT1 out of that picture, then they're taking that interferon dependent arm of the signaling out of it. And so that's where that work has has started to characterize those ISGs. But, you know, ISG expression can be very cell type specific too. So I think we're really just scratching the surface on, on knowing the real power of IRF1 as an antiviral uh, protein. So your flaviviruses inhibit the STAT1 pathway, but there are non-STAT dependent signaling pathways as well, right? Yes, do, yeah. Do they participate in those as well, or they're not relevant to flavies? They are relevant to flavies. Um, 
Michael Gale's work has shown that actually some of these other arms of, of activation that, that tends to come around to the stats again, but that these viruses are also modulating those other arms too. But we know less about that because we've been concentrating on trying to understand how exactly even this main arm is being suppressed. That's remained fairly enigmatic for 10 years now. So do you know how the RNA polymerase interferes with the signaling? Yeah, we're starting to get a handle on that. We don't know um, completely, but I think it's associated with loss of the interferon receptor. So Jared Evans at Pittsburgh originally showed in 2011 that West Nile virus in particular could get rid of the interferon receptor subunit, just one of the subunits. And we think that NS5 probably has a role in that. That's what we're trying to work out right now. And I'm sure we'll be hearing about that in the literature at some point, right? Hopefully soon. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, there is one Flavy virus vaccine, yellow fever vaccine, yeah, right? That that's licensed and used. Mm -hmm. Are any of the attenuating mutations in that virus in the RNA polymerase in the region you've identified? Oh, I wish, we haven't looked at that one, but the um, Japanese encephalitis virus actually has an attenuated vaccine too. That's this right, is this right. SA1442 strain, and that one has some mutations in NS5 that uh, reduce its ability to suppress these pathways, yes. So if you introduce these mutations in NS5 into um, into any other virulent strains, would it attenuate them in an animal model? I believe so. Um, the only work that we've done was actually trying to do the opposite. So looking at this Kunjin, this attenuated West Nile strain um, with Alex Cromick in Australia and, and introducing that single, one single amino acid mutation from the New York 99 strain of West Nile that actually makes it into a, a better inhibitor of signaling. And that worked in tissue culture. In animal models, it didn't um, have the effects that we had hoped in terms of making this virus um, more resistant or, and more virulent. But uh, we could see some effects in terms of virus replication. Virus replication was higher in those animals. And I think because these viruses have other attenuating mutations in the envelope protein, et cetera, that maybe um, it's not, I hate to say it, it's not the single most important thing in the virus in determining virulence. Why do you think the polymerase evolved to have this function, because as you, I don't think poliovirus polymerase does this. We don't have any evidence for that. So why, do you have any thoughts about why that would be? Is it just a random genetic economy? I think that it's more the genetic economy story. So if you only have 10 viral proteins, you have to do this in the, in the best way that is presented to you in terms of virus host evolution. And so I imagine that, you know, that NS5 protein was right place, right time kind of thing. I, 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 obviously these viruses don't think about it. If they thought okay. about it, maybe they could put this on a more um, pliable protein. But I really just think it's um, evolutionary pressure and opportunity for a given protein, yeah. If they thought about it, I think we'd be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. Um, so despite, despite antagonizing innate responses, um, there's still, uh, the many hosts still live. The, the virus doesn't wipe out right. all its hosts. Right. Why? Well, because I think that in general, uh, as most people know, a virus, you don't, as a virus, you can't wipe out 100% of your host because then you've got nowhere to go in terms of transmission. So there's going to be attenuating mutations that are built in somewhere to make sure that that doesn't happen. In terms of the interferon response specifically, um, if you, what we do know is that if a host that would otherwise survive doesn't have that uh, interferon response, then that host is dead. So it's a trade-off between these roles of interferon very locally at the individual cell, which is going to promote virus replication and uh, spread to other cells, versus the interferon response at the level of the host, uh, 
really being able to dampen that enough so that you just have uh, maybe a transmission event but not disease. And then you've got polymorphisms in your host um, that obviously are going to dictate whether or not that interferon response as a whole is ultimately successful. And then I hate not to say anything about the adaptive response because, you know, in the end that's important too. But I think that the, um, so you can have failures there, but the correct uh, information being relayed from this early viral infection from that infected cell is going to then be responsible for relaying those uh, messages to the adaptive response and so that's also going to be an important bridge that you know may or may not be affected by infection. You know we tend to study viruses in simple cell culture, animal systems, looking at one thing at a time. But in reality, you know, the human population or the animal population right. is so right. diverse yeah. and the ecological factors, we just never consider that it's really hard to do that. So it's incredibly complicated. It's amazing that we get the answers that we do. Yeah. So, so I think an untapped area is what you mentioned, the, the host polymorphisms in these genes. They're likely yeah. to control how a virus does in an entire population yeah. of seven billion hosts, right? Yeah. And so that does become an important question is, can we look at disease resistance profiles in different human populations? And then maybe that's telling us real secrets about where therapeutics should be. And yeah, yeah. yeah. Is, is that something that you're interested in? Uh, we've become interested in it because now we have these tenable targets. It's taken us a long time to, to identify the targets that we think are really the most relevant to infection. And, and we certainly haven't found them all, but we have a few that we can now look at in terms of some therapeutic aspects. And whether or not we can target the host side of that, and therefore, you know, the, the general thinking is if you can target the host, then you're not gonna have the opportunity so easily for virus revertance and, and um, resistance. So we're kind of looking at a couple of those questions. The downside, of course, is there may be side effects, right? Sure which you don't know about, which can yeah. be the case with any antiviral therapy, but when you yeah. target the host, that might be more of an issue. But I think for these acute infections, yeah. you know, like the flaviviruses, it's hopefully you can, you know, undergo a two week course or, a, or you know, certainly less than a month's course and, and of therapeutics. And so there's real possibilities there, maybe persistent infections, it's not so mm -hmm. easy. Right. So yeah. can, you, can you give us a sense of what lies ahead for your laboratory? What are you going to be interested in? Oh, this is a difficult question. <laughs> I think uh, we are going to continue certainly down the road of, of these interactions specifically at that innate re immune response. We'd like to know where in the host that's important. You know, what cell types are really the critical ones for um, for resistance to infection from a host point of view. And then can we dissect out specific ISGs that are responsible for virus clearance, or not, we're never gonna get virus clearance from the innate response, but uh, resistance. And so, so I think that we're going to uh, be looking at those ISGs as uh, at a little bit more of a molecular level in terms of interactions. And then we might actually branch out a little bit from the flavies. That's the opportunity that this um, environment here at Rocky Mountain Labs gives us, you know, with Heinz Feldman and his collection. So I think we'll start branching out a little bit more and, and looking to see if there are any ISGs that are more broadly antiviral. So if we really did develop a therapeutic, could we then, um, have a chance at treating a number of infections with one approach. Well, certainly IRF1 fits the IRF1, category, right? Yeah. But it's not an IS, it is an ISG, but it's not a direct antiviral protein, Absolutely. as you said. Yeah. It's a transcriptional activator, but that could be one. Yeah. I think that inhibited every virus in the rice shagen screen, right? Absolutely. I'm pretty sure it was up in the top 10 at least. Yeah. For, yeah. yeah. Certainly it's the most potent for poliovirus. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Byron, we haven't talked about prions with anyone on TWIV so far. And well, they're not viruses. They're not viruses. <laughs> I understand. But you know what someone, I think Lynn Enquist told me years ago, or maybe someone else, that when prion, prions, is that how we say it? Or prions? Either way. Prion. Yeah, we'll prion. go with prion for now. I think that's what my virology class 
I, I once said, what is it, prion or prion? And they said prion. Lynn Enquist said when they first emerged and were studied by uh, Bruce and, and others, that only the virologists would listen to right. them. Is that true? Because the oh. other people wouldn't listen. It's an infectious process, an infectious disease, and the virologist said, oh, this is interesting. And in fact, in every virology text, including ours, we talk about prions, even though it's not a virus. I give a lecture in my virology course on prions. Well, of course, they were, as Marshall pointed out, originally described as slow viruses. So right. there was a, an yeah. initial <laughs> bias toward them being viruses because we didn't know of any other possibility, really, that would be consistent with the transmissibility of these agents between individuals. It was obviously a very small particle. Um, but it also, people realized early on, in, in, the, in the 60s even, um, that there were certain features of viruses that were inconsistent with, with these uh, TSC uh, agents, or as we now call them, prions. Um, namely, they were incredibly resistant to, uh, much more resistant than typical viruses to decontamination, either with irradiation or, or types of chemicals that would be suitable for inactivating viruses. And uh, nobody could find an agent-specific, an infectious agent-specific nucleic acid or a specific immune response to these agents. So from the get, I mean, from decades ago, people were wondering what, you know, what the fundamental nature of these pathogens is. They're small like viruses, but there's, there were certain differences that people realized and and even early on in the 60s it was proposed that uh, they might in fact be self-propagating pathological states of proteins um, and in fact of a host protein and totally lacking in their own nucleic acid genome long before the word prion was coined All right so what today what is how, how would you define a prion well, there's a couple uh, definitions. Uh, it's being debated. I mean, at, at every turn, there are sort of tweaks to the, the overall prion concept. But basically, you need to have uh, a self-propagating state of a protein, a misfolded state of a protein that can propagate itself um, by grabbing on to the normal co uh, its normal counterpart in the host and corrupting it. And and without having any agent, infectious agent specific nucleic acid genome. Another part of that definition, an extension that Reed Wickner uh, came up with, was it uh, is that prions are also, and this is based on yeast prion models now, are also proteinaceous elements of inheritance, so epigenetic elements that without any transfer of nucleic acid-based inf genetic information can confer a, a transmission or, or heritability of, of, of a phenotype. In yeasts, there are many ge genes that encode proteins with prion-like properties, right, mm -hmm. that change states. Yeah, and in fact, I think in my mind, Reed Wickner and others work on yeast prions was the first demonstration that prions as infectious proteins, self-propagating proteins, exist in biology because this was using the power of yeast genetics. It was much easier to prove that point in a bomb-proof fashion than it ever was to prove that for mammalian TSE prions. Right. So in yeast, these prions exist in two states and have two different functions, right? That's my understanding. Yeah, so the prion state is, is almost always an aggregated state and usually an amyloid, sort of fibrillar state of, of the yeast protein that uh, has an altered activity relative to the normal soluble form. So in humans and other animals, there, there are pathogenic prions, misfolded proteins that cause disease. Are there other genes that encode what we think are prions, like those in yeast that are not pathogenic in mammals, do you know? 
that are not pathogenic? Yes. Oh, uh, well, that's a, that's a subject of debate. Um, there are reports now of physiological amyloids that can propagate themselves at least locally within a cell. Um, whether they can move from cell to cell the way real infectious prions do is another question. I think the biggest frontier really are in our field right now is the extent to which a whole group of very important protein misfolding diseases such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, Huntington's, ALS, even type 2 diabetes to some extent, uh, whether they might have prion-like um, aspects to their pathogenesis. That is, not necessarily because it hasn't really been documented in any practical sense that these are transmissible diseases, though right. they may still right. be, perhaps, but that they have a spreading-like aspect to, 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 the, to the pathogenesis. That is, this protein, this, this folding of the given protein that, that lies at the core of the pathogenesis of these various diseases can not only propagate by growing as a fibril through some sort of seeded polymerization mechanism, but also can move from cell to cell, perhaps from tissue to tissue. And then the big open question is to what extent might they be moved from individual to individual. Right. And uh, this is a really key issue in the field at this point. So a key part of the prion definition is not that you make an amyloid fibril, you, you know, that you have seeded polymerization and make fibrils in a localized site. You also have to have mechanisms uh, for moving, for, for, for propagating that misfolding process from, at least from cell to cell, tissue to tissue, and ultimately the way it really happens in bona fide mammalian TSE prion diseases from individual to individual. So the TSC, one of the parts of that acronym is transmissible. And so how, tell us how these diseases are transmitted among sheep or humans or other animals. Well, I mean, this is a, a huge uh, and poorly understood question. I mean, the most celebrated uh, situation that we know about uh, basically won Carlton Gadjusek, mm -hmm. the, the first Nobel Prize for these diseases, when he figured out that the 4A tribes people in New Guinea um, were transmitting it from person to person through a ritual cannibalism event that they uh, took part in. And so it was through the oral route. So they ate the brains of the deceased, right? Right, they'd eat their family members who had died of, of the disease as, as part of a ritual of respect, um, apparently and uh, also to, I think he argues, maybe to address uh, extreme protein deficiency as well. So, so, and then of course the BSE or mad cow disease, ep disease epidemic um, arose out of sort of an agricultural cannibalism, whereby right, right. Chopped, you know, remains of cattle were fed back into cattle. Um, and that's probably, I mean, that's clearly a very bad idea. So, <laughs> but the, a really interesting issue, and, and in humans, back to the human case, it's, it's clear that you can, through iatrogenic means, that is through medical procedures, uh, transmit Creutzfeldt-Jakob disease or CJD from person to person through um, contamination of surgical equipments uh, trans, uh, through transplants of CJD contaminated tissues through um, growth hormone uh, injections when the growth hormone by mistake was derived from a CJD patient's pituitary gland those sort of things th those sort of things happen in humans but I think the most puzzling um, issue is how do, how do these diseases spread naturally um, amongst sheep, for instance, but most spectacularly in terms of efficiency between deer and elk in the case of chronic wasting disease, which is basically the same sort of disease in cervids. So um, they're, they're so efficient, this sort of horizontal transmission, presumably via the environment, um, that uh, 
local populations, either in game farms or even free-ranging populations, can have very high incidences of this deadly disease of some people say 25 percent, sometimes even even higher percentages. So it's sweeping through certain populations with alarming efficiency in, in different parts of North America. We uh, don't know how it's transmitted. Well, we know now, as we've gotten better and better tests for the presence of, uh, of prions, that in, infectious material is shed uh, through, from deer and elk uh, pretty high levels. Fe fecal Fe shedding? Feces, urine, saliva, blood, and of course when the animal dies, the, the carcass, and especially the central nervous system, contains just bucket loads of infectivity that is then spread into the environment, perhaps with okay. the help of scavengers and so forth. And then it's clear that at least experimentally, uh, you, the, the animals can pick it up by oral, by, by the oral route, but also by nasal um, mm -hmm. route as well. Um, so there are a lot of possibilities. The challenge now is to figure out from a practical point of view, amongst all of these possible routes that can be demonstrated experimentally, <laughs> which ones are really important in, in the real world. And that, that applies also to the human TSC diseases. And, and even the question in the case of human TSC diseases, you know, does it really happen? To what extent does it really happen? Um, this sort of transmission between humans, especially, may perhaps be a blood transfusions or yeah, medical yeah. procedures and so forth and so on. So I'm, I don't understand how if you ingest a, a misfolded prion or have it <coughs> put into your blood, how does it reach the CNS? Because that's where the disease is, right? Especially after eating contaminated meat. Yeah, so uh, we don't, for one thing, it's very hard for the digestive system to break down these things completely because these amyloid fibrillar forms of the prion protein are very tough and very resistant to proteases and, and, and to denaturation. So they, they survive spectacularly well compared to most things that we would eat in the digestive tract. Then uh, the thought is, and, and this happens at least to some extent, whether it's the most important event all the time is not so clear. Uh, um, they can be taken up by Pyre's patches in the, you know, in the gut and delivered eventually to uh, follicular dendritic cells in the lymphoid system and then move on to peripheral nerves and, and then move via, via neural circuitry into the brain and then uh, throughout the brain. And th that part has to happen for, for disease really to be observed. So this neuroinvasion and, and spread throughout the nervous system is really, really important. So you mentioned before BSC, bovine spongiform encephalopathy, mad cow disease. So uh, it's my understanding that there's a low rate of BSC in all cows that are raised for meat consumption. So that's obviously a concern because I think the cows are killed before they would show symptoms of the disease. Mm -hmm. So how do we deal with that? Well, I mean, it, it is a concern. There seems to be a, a certain basal rate of spontaneous disease now in, in cattle that may or may not be exactly like BSE. Uh, but um, so it's going to be an on, uh, ongoing concern, but uh, several practical measures can ha have really put a damper on the possibilities of BSE expanding in the, in, in the cow population, the cattle population, and representing a, a problem in humans. And for one, you prevent it from becoming a BSE epidemic by no longer feeding cattle into cattle. And then you only harvest for beef purposes younger animals before they've even had much chance if there's, uh, to accumulate much infectivity. Um, and usually if it's a spontaneous disease, we think it's likely to occur predominantly, at least based on the situation in humans in, in, in much older animals. So take younger animals alone. Um, there are also is, uh, efforts to limit the use of nervous tissue in the human food supply. And so that can, uh, or, or other 
organs, visceral organs, that are known to contain higher amounts of infectivity. So you can reduce the risk rather dramatically that way, and it certainly had the effect of not only reducing the BSE epidemic worldwide in cattle, but also basically very much putting the brakes on the appearance of variant CJD in humans, which is the form of CJD that humans get when they're infected with, with BSE. So it's, it's really been an effective approach just to take these uh, sorts of, uh, of measures. So you mentioned sporadic. Probably we should explain that not all these diseases are transmitted. They can occur sporadically in animals and in humans there's a genetic component as well? Yeah, so in, in, just to take the human case, most cases, 90 percent at least of, of the CJD cases, um, just appear in people who um, have no mut apparent mutation in their prion protein gene. So we call it sporadic, meaning it's basically of unknown origin. Then maybe 10% uh, of the cases can be linked to identifiable mutations in the, in the germline prion protein sequence, prion protein being the protein that's converted into this pathological infectious material. So uh, that, that's, that's what's meant by uh, sporadic. And, and it, it now appears that sporadic cases are likely to be happening in, in cattle as well which means we need to stay vigilant um, in terms of the possible, uh, you know, and, and take appropriate measures to prevent outbreaks in, in cattle as well as. So you, you've developed ways to amplify prions to, to make it easier to detect them. Can you tell us how that works? Yeah, so we, we don't, we're not really amplifying the prions as the infectious material because um, what we're making after the amplification is not, not infectious. But we're taking advantage of this basic principle that prions have of being able to act as seeds for the polymerization of the normal form of the prion protein. And we're taking that, so what we've done is devised uh, conditions whereby we put infectious material into a tube that contains, or a, 90, a well of a 96 well plate that has a vast excess of recombinant normal, basically normal mm -hmm. prion protein. What's the and source of the infectious material? Whatever. I mean, it an can animal? be a, an animal, a human, uh, a wide variety of tissues and materials from a wide variety of animals with TSE disease. And you can put that into this basic reaction and it has the incredible ability, each individual seed can um, seed the polymerization of a huge excess of, of this bacterial expressed recombinant prion protein generating amyloid fibrils that then are easily detected by a fluorescence plate reader because um, by virtue of having an amyloid sensitive fluorescent dye in the reaction. So you can get through this basic seeded polymerization mechanism amplifications of a billion or even uh, a trillion fold of the presence of, of the seed. We're not strictly speaking amplifying the infectious agent, but we're amplifying the presence of the infectious agent this way. And this, um, can, how, how does this work at room temperature? You have to incubate 37 degrees. Do you need cycles? What do you do? Yes, yeah, so basically, I mean, nowadays, there are many renditions of this type of assay, but where we are now is to put it, put all these, uh, these simple materials into a 96 well plate and subject it to shaking at, at various temperatures, cycles of shaking and rest. Um, we're continuing to ratchet up the temperature. We started at 37 degrees, uh, but now we're pushing closer to 55 degrees because we have just recently found that we can um, reduce the time required for an uh, assay that is now done to diagnose CJD in humans based on, uh, on analysis of their cerebral spinal fluid from a five-day reaction down to something less than a day. Just by raising temperatures, adjusting conditions, so forth and so on, but, uh, and, and substrates, but it's a now getting much more uh, 
practical to, to detect infectious prions in various samples that might be a source of concern and also to diagnose these uh, diseases in humans and animals uh, before they're dead. Because um, prior to this point, uh, the only definitive diagnosis of CJD in humans or animals was either be a post-mortem analysis of their brain tissue or uh, requiring a brain biopsy, which most individuals don't want to undergo. But now, now we have means for very sensitively and specifically detecting the presence of prions uh, in living patients and living animals. So if you don't take a brain biopsy, how would you get a sample to subject to your assay? Well, I mentioned before that the, I, uh, now the most prevalent analysis for human CJD diagnosis is, anal is looking at their cerebral spinal fluid. So you right. take a, a spinal tap and, and you perform this assay that I've described on the cerebral spinal fluid. The, and that's working really well. Uh, the various uh, large studies have shown 80 to 90 percent diagnostic sensitivity and virtually 100 percent specificity uh, for diagnosing sporadic CJD. But what we've uh, just recently found in the last couple years um, is that we can even improve on that already excellent sensitivity uh, by by taking simple nasal brushings. Um, so uh, a colleague of mine with whom we're collaborating now, Gianluigi Zanuso in, in Italy, had noted some years ago that uh, CJD patients, human CJD patients, have the abnormal infectious form of, of prion protein lining their nasal bulb. And so when he learned about our assay, he came up and he said, why don't we test I, he said, I can go in with a little brush and I can uh, just wipe the surface of the nasal vault where you, the sensory neurons are that give you the sense of smell and just give a little brush and, and we'll drop it into some PBS and spin it down and send it to you in Montana to see if you can uh, pick up the infectivity. And, and the upshot of it is, is that um, We've now looked at nearly 40 CJD patients and 50 or so non-CJD controls, either normal people or, or people with other neurological diseases such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's. And we, the test is now giving a much stronger and um, faster reaction uh, uh, in, in our test and we're getting nearly 100% diagnostic sensitivity and by that I mean the percentage of CJD patient samples that give us a positive reaction and 100% specificity, that is the number of, the percentage of non-CJD controls that give you a negative reaction um, with, this sim with this simple test. So we're very excited uh, about that as a, as a relatively painless and uh, non-invasive test. I think it's something that people would much prefer to undergo than a spinal tap even. Um, and in uh, a way of, uh, for, for diagnosing um, right. CJD. So presumably this will stimulate the development of treatments, right? Because right now I don't think we can, there's no drug to treat right. a, a TSC, but if you make a nice diagnostic test, that's usually an impetus. Is that how you view it? Yeah. I mean, for one thing, it will allow us to make a definitive diagnosis much earlier than is possible. And this is a huge problem for all neurological diseases. I'm not a clinician, but this is what I'm told, that you know, when people show up in the clinic with various um, early neurological signs or whatever, it can be very difficult. I'm patients and patients' families have told me this as, as well. It can sometimes even take years of them bouncing around between doctors trying to figure out Get, get a clear idea of what the problem is. And so if you have an early definitive test, for one thing, you can, if treatments come along, you can start much, much earlier than you otherwise would. And um, that's really important because one of the huge problems with a rapidly progressing disease, once clinical signs show up like CJD, is that, you know, once they really show up in the clinic, uh, 
and once you spend a little bit of time really trying to, to work out what they might have, there's so much damage done to the brain that it's almost too late. So getting an early diagnosis is critically important. You can imagine it's going to be especially important in the 10% or so uh, human cases that are where they may, they, don't, they know they're in a family that carries a, a disease-associated mutation and you, but, but only shows up later on in life and you might be able to follow the, the incipient disease and instigate some sort of therapeutic once they come along um, by monitoring this situation, maybe simply by taking these, uh, these nasal brushings as well. And, a, and another really important spin-off that we have imagined and, and many others now we see um, when, when they see our results with, with this nasal brushings for CJD, there's no reason why a similar approach using a same sort of seeded polymerization based assay um, can't be used to get an early definitive, more definitive diagnosis of a variety of other important neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, ALS, uh, so forth, because especially in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, there's very, very early olfactory uh, problems that show up. And, and again, if, as therapeutics come along, and if you could monitor people who may be in a family that's predisposed to Alzheimer's or whatever, or even just as they show up with the most vague symptoms, you could go in and say, oh, yeah, they've got misfolded tau, or they've got uh, Alzheimer's beta amyloid there, or it's, you know, or no, it looks more like Parkinson's. You could, before clinical signs get too, too bad, and probably a lot more cheaply than with an MRI or whatever, you could, um, not only initiate what you would hope to be effective therapy, but another huge advantage would be even to, in terms of development of, of therapeutics for these diseases is to have a relatively a specific and non-invasive way to monitor progress in therapeutic trials without having to wait for the clinical symptoms, you, you know. So this, there's a lot of excitement about those sort of possibilities here. Very exciting. But it's not virology. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> We're still very interested. And you're on This Week in Virology. We don't have This Week in TSEs yet. <laughs> or Thank TWIP, you. This Week in Prions. We got a TWIP already, right? <laughs> right. This Week in Parasitism. All right. <laughs> so, Marshall, let's, let's end this TWIP with you. You told me yesterday you spend 80% of your time <clears throat> doing administration. I'm really sorry about that. <laughs> about 20% you do science. Uh, yeah, I try, but, I, I, you know... I think the most satisfying part of what I do now is really um, being able to help the younger investigators that are here, you know, like Sonia and even Byron, who's younger, <laughs> good to be called young, <laughs> <Yeah. right now. laughs> succeed and try to insulate them from all the baloney which comes down, you know, through all the regulations and stuff that are imposed on us. And, and, and I'm happy to talk about my own research a little bit, but before I do that, I want to say a couple of things. I want, I want to say that you're talking to two extraordinary people he, here, and That's I think... That's why it, we picked them. Well, <laughs> and uh, they are really only give you a, a ta a a, a, an appetizer of the breadth of the virology work that's done here at Rocky Mountain Laboratories, not to mention the outstanding uh, bacterial work which is done on diseases like tularemia plague and Lyme disease. And it, it, it really is a unique community uh, as, part, as far as the National Institutes of Health is concerned because in a relative, almost like on an island, we have people working on bacteria, we have people working on proteins, we have per people working on viruses and the innate immune response, and working on everything from mouse leukemia virus to Ebola virus. I mean, an yep. a extraordinary span of infectious, dise of infectious diseases, and to have people like Sonia to offer them the opportunity to do this kind of signal pathway and transduction and innate immunity and stuff like that on viruses like, you know, the phylo viruses like Ebola virus and Marburg, uh, some of the real fancy flu viruses, MERS, SARS. Uh, you know, it, it's a unique, the word is, you're not supposed to say unique anymore. You're supposed to say distinctive. It's a distinctive uh, 
opportunity for people to work on vi virology. One of the virus families, which unfortunately we don't have an opportunity to talk about today, were the bunya viruses. And when you gave your seminar yesterday, well, I think one of those, one of your symbols was a bunya virus. This is going to be a growth industry in viruses in, around the world. And there are two, three, actually, bunya viruses have emerged as significant problems in like the last three or four years. One is this veterinary infection called Schmallenberg virus in Europe, the severe fever and thrombocytopenia virus in China, and in the United States, an, another uh, tick-borne bunya virus called heartland virus. And some of those are very, very poorly understood. And the bunya viruses, you know, are probably the, one of the most significant virus families, but one of the most understudied virus families. And we've got uh, some terrific people here uh, studying, uh, studying bunya viruses. And a lot of stuff is going to come out of that. And as Sonia alluded to, they have some of their own unique mechanisms for um, interfering with innate immune pathways. Um, I don't understand all those mechanisms, and I certainly wouldn't try to talk, but there's going to be a lot of information coming out about that, and it's going to feed right into the stuff that Charlie and, uh, and what's-his-name did about all these innate, innate immune signals. So, I mean, for... John. What? John. John Shoggins. John, yeah. <laughs> I thought it was John, but I didn't want to say it. But it was really Fred. I didn't want to say Fred. <laughs> I didn't want to say John. So I mean, this is an extraordinary time for people to get interested in microbiology and infectious diseases. Sounds I like I should come back and do more podcasts. I think uh, you can leave your stuff here <laughs> and come back anytime. Right, everybody? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> No, we do microbiology. We do parasitology podcasts. So I'm happy to come back. I, okay. I, even though it's a small town, I don't mind coming. <laughs> it's got good coffee. Eh? It does have good coffee. Yeah. Tell so, us a little bit about okay, what, what you're I, doing. Yeah, what I want to say is uh, I'm going to answer that question indirectly. But Sonia really talked about the only part of the cycle of these vector-borne viruses, the vector-borne flavy viruses, and the part that Gain, certainly gains the most interest from a human virology, an animal virology part, is what those viruses do in animals and primarily in people. But they have a whole other parallel universe that they exist in, which is really the cycle in the arthropod host. And so we only, st at, at this point, very, very little study is done on the virology of those arthropod-borne viruses and the tick-borne flaviviruses in particular in mammalian system. There's a lot done on those viruses in mammalian system and the pathogenesis of the diseases that they cause and the spectrum of uh, illnesses and maladies that they produce, which is tremendous around the world. But you know, that ain't their main job. Their main job is to persist in the ticks. And who knows what the constraints on those viruses are? like the, the innate immune antagonism in human beings. I mean, there's nothing known about um, how those viruses are interacting with whatever innate immune mechanisms arthropods and, and ticks have. That's their main defense, right? They don't have an adaptive it, Well, yeah, but they, pro they've got, they probably immune. have some innate immune factors which aren't really studied, aren't very, really studied very well. And the viruses that in mammalian cells, at least when you infect the cells in the first place, are highly cytolytic. But when you infect tick cells with the same virus, you can't even tell you did anything to them. So, you know, what's going on there? Why are the tick cells different? With the, with the, in the, the tick-borne encephalitis viruses, it's estimated that 95% of the evolutionary time of that virus is actually spread, is, is actually spent in the tick. And the virus is able to, cir to, to go all the way around the life cycle from the egg to the larvae to the nymph to the adult and then back through the eggs. Now that cycle is dependent upon, at every phase, is dependent upon the tick feeding on a small animal or a skunk or, or a sheep or something like that. But the role that the animal, and, and the people are almost inadvertent hosts, and you know with West Nile virus like horses, horses are. So one of the things that I, I've realized over the last couple of years when we talk about pathogenesis, of these infections, I think it's too confining a definition. And I think we really have to talk about virus biology, 
in the broader sense because you really, to study it, you have to have systems biology, you have to have structural biology, you have to have molecular biology. <clears throat> and I think what's, uh, you know, a broader view of virus infection is going gonna, is gonna to demand that, that we, that we look at these things. And so we've been interested in the last couple of years at looking at just a couple of aspects of uh, the biology of the of the vector borne of the vector borne and flavy viruses, and one of them really relates to uh, the pers to persistent infection in some really uh, neat work and cool work that one of my postdocs, uh, 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 Luanika Malera from Zimbabwe, is doing. If you take um, mammalian cells and you infect them with uh, one of the tick-borne flavy viruses, they all die, but not quite. There's a few that are left over. They don't die. And if you leave them alone and you feed them, within a week, you repopulate that flask of cells. 90% of those cells are infected, and the virus is maintained for at least a year by serially passaging those cells. So you can establish persistence with the tick-borne flaviviruses in a mammalian system. And there's evidence from some of the human um, uh, disease reports in Europe that persistent TB EV infection can exist and lead to the sort of chronic neurological symptoms that we were talking about yesterday and which are also seen in some people with uh, uh, chronic uh, uh, West Nile virus. And so what is the role that persistence is playing in uh, the biology of these viruses in, 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 in mammalian hosts? And this is one of the things we're starting to look at. I think it's going to turn out to be terif terrifically interesting. And we've really adopted sort of an agnostic approach to looking at this, we're using deep sequencing. So you have no idea what's going to show up as important. And, you know, the, certainly the innate immune stuff is going to be very, very interesting. But, you know, there's probably a lot of other stuff that people aren't thinking about. You know, the metabolomics or the lipid, uh, lipidomics of the cells. And so, you know, in, in the next few years, we hope to take, uh, we hope to take, uh, we hope to be able to take a look at that. Then the, the other aspect that we've really been looking at takes advantage of another uh, wonderful resource that we have <clears throat> at Rocky Mountain Labs, which is an exceptional microscopy facility uh, with about a half a dozen electron scanning and transmission electron microscopes, including a very, very fancy one called a Titan Cryo microscope. And using these, it's possible to study the biology of the virus infection in cells uh, using techniques called electron tomography, which really at the level of the electron microscope, it, it's almost like a confocal or a CAT scan or an MRI of a cell at the level of electron microscope where the microscope collects a variety of different slices and then a real fancy computer puts them all together and you can turn them around. And <clears throat> finding some very, very interesting things, uh, the and there's only a few places in the world that are actually able to study uh, these virus infections with methodology like that because of the rare, rarity of these electron microscopes. When the, when the flaviviruses enter a cell, uh, one of the first, it, as Sonia alluded to, the genome is a single-stranded uh, plus sense RNA which functions as a messenger, gets translated, gets clipped up into a variety of protein, proteins. And as part of the replication cycle, um, the proteins create spherules, which really kind of bud into the endoplasmic reticulum, and they call it, they call them a sphere about 80, to, uh, 60, 80 nanometers in size. And it's inside those little spherules that the virus replicate, the double-stranded RNA replication goes on. And the flavies are not unique in that. Many of the other plus sense viruses, like polio, really does something very, very similar. And one of the reasons the virus is thought to do that is by replicating its double-stranded RNA inside one of these spherules, the double-stranded RNA is actually protected right. from the double-stranded RNA sensors in the cells because double-stranded RNA is something that the innate immune response recognizes, this doesn't belong here, let's get rid of it, yep. or let's try to get rid of it. And so we were able to study um, using the electron microscope, look at those spherules, identify by cryotomography that there are components inside those spherules which probably represent the double-stranded RNA and the, the, and the polymerase NS5 uh, 
and some of the other virus proteins which are involved in that. And we've been able to show that um, you see those in the mammalian cells. And when you infect the tick cells, you see very, very similar structures, although there's not as many of them because the virus doesn't, doesn't grow as well. And we hope to be able, over the next couple of years, to taking the individual virus proteins or sets of the virus proteins to figure out <clears throat> which ones of the virus proteins are responsible for this exuberant proliferation of endoplasmic reticulum and the creation of these spherules, what virus protein is involved, and then what are the cellular partners which are involved in doing this. So for polio, the RNA replicates on the surface but it's still thought to be a way to shield the RNA exactly. from being sensed. Exactly. So somehow being right next to a membrane may be enough to shield it from rig eye and any yeah. other sensors. It's really and it's been showed with JEV, I think, that, that de it delays the exposure of the RNA. It probably doesn't absolutely present, prevent it. So with that... This is an interesting... Enough? Yeah, that's great. This is an interesting way of saying you need to do basic research. Right. It doesn't all have to be focused on a disease, right? You get smart people in a great environment and you give them the resources and then good things will always happen. You can't predict, but that's the nature of science. Right. You cannot predict. Exactly. What's it's like happen. the quote from Einstein, if we knew what we were doing, it wouldn't be research. That's right. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Marshall. And this uh, that'll do it for this episode of, of TWIV. And you'll be able to find this one as well as all the others we've made. And you know, we're going to hit number 300 in August. They're all online at twiv.tv, also on iTunes. You can find them all there. And we usually love to get your questions and comments. You can send them to twiv at twiv.tv. I want to thank everybody for participating today in this twiv. Marshall Bloom, thank you, thank you so much. Sonia Best, thank My you. My pleasure. And Byron Cawhee, thank you so much thank you. for joining us today. I want to thank Logan Bandiga, Bandega, close, <laughs> for inviting me and ferrying me around and uh, being a nice guy. Thank you so much, Logan. I really appreciate it. And I want to thank the audience for joining us as well. Uh, we really appreciate your coming here. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You can also find me on Twitter, P-R-O-F-V-R-R. -R. Go follow me there and find out uh, what's going on in the virology world. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs>